I want to read the Word of God this morning from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34. And we're going to read from the commencement of this chapter down to verse 19. Ezekiel chapter 34. The theme here is that of the shepherd. And as we know, there were the false shepherds in Israel. But then the Lord said that he would raise up a true shepherd. And ultimately the true shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're reading from verse 1, Ezekiel chapter 34, and beginning at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves, and not should not the shepherds feed the flocks. Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out, as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick, because I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. As for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the he-goats. Seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, but ye must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures." And to have drunk of the deep waters, but ye must foul the residue with your feet. And as for my flock, they eat that which ye have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which ye have fouled with your feet. Amen. We'll end there at verse 19. We know the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his holy and inspired word this day for his name's sake. Would you turn please to Psalm 23? 
And that's where you'll find uh, our text this morning that I want to come to consider. We've been reading a portion there in Ezekiel chapter 34 that highlights the Lord as the shepherd. And as we know, this is the shepherd's psalm. And I want to bring you to the very last verse of the psalm and the opening words of it uh, this morning, where David said in Psalm 23 and verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It's these words that I want us to consider and I want us to think about the shepherd's care for us as his people. Let's bow together in prayer for a moment and ask the Lord to bless his word today. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank thee that we are in thy house and we have the opportunity of now coming around thy word. And we pray that thou will come and speak to us from thy truth, open up thy word to us, open up our hearts to thy word in return. And may thy word today enter in and take root and may it speak with us. May it rejoice our hearts as thy people. May it challenge the hearts of the unconverted. O Lord, let it be that sanctifying and saving word to this congregation and to my own soul. We need help and therefore, Lord, we look to thee for the help of the Holy Spirit. Thou hast promised us help. There's one who is the comforter, the one called alongside to help us. And we pray that we might know thy blessing now as we come around thy word. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There is a New Testament theme that I think we can apply to Psalm 23 that really does, uh, I think, open it up and give to us an understanding of what it is that the psalmist is seeking to convey to us. Uh, throughout this, this well-known psalm. And it's found in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9 and 10 where it says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. And I think those words there that you have in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10, ye are complete in him, could be taken and brought back here to Psalm 23 and could become the summary of this psalm. As we know, this psalm is very well known and well loved by the people of God and how much comfort and encouragement the people of God get from this psalm, particularly maybe in times of need and difficulty, maybe even in times of, of sorrow and bereavement. There has been much comfort that has come from this psalm. But the obvious question is, well, why is it such a comfort? And it's because of the statements that are found in it. Well, what are the statements that are found in it? What is the, the theme of the psalm? What is the truth that is being conveyed to our hearts when we go through these words? And I'm sure many of us here could say the psalm off by heart. You wouldn't even have to look at it on the page of the Bible at all because it's so well known either in, in the scriptural form or in the metrical form of it. The words are so familiar to us. But what is the theme of it? And I think the theme of it is those words that are found there in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ye are complete in him. Because what is set out before us here, if you go through clause by clause, is the Lord's complete care, the Lord's complete provision for those who are the sheep of his pasture, those who are his, those who are born of his spirit and washed in his blood and belong to him. There is a care that the Lord exercises. There is a provision that the Lord makes for those who, who are his own. And I want to just mention in passing, it's not our our main theme this morning, but do you notice there how you go through that psalm and it becomes more personal? Because if you look at verses 2, 3, and 4, and part of 4 at least, it's in the third person. You know, verse 2, he maketh me to lie down, he leadeth me, he restoreth my soul. That's in the third person. But as you get to the conclusion of the psalm, it changes from the third person into the second person. It becomes more personal. And isn't that true with the Christian's walk with God? It becomes more personal. We might know the Lord and, and come to know him in a saving way, but as the, as the Christian begins to walk with the Lord and fellowship with the Lord and commune with the Lord as they pilgrimage through this world, the Lord becomes more precious. That fellowship becomes more intimate. 
There is a closeness and a nearness that develops in that individual who's walking with the Lord between them and the Lord. And just as the psalmist here is moving from the third person to the second person, and he's able to speak there as he comes towards the close of the psalm, halfway through verse 4, Thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. Verse 5, Thou preparest the table uh, before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. It's becoming more personal. And the more we know the Lord, the more we come to appreciate his care and his provision for us. The longer we are saved, I think, the more the Lord becomes precious to us and the things of God become more precious uh, to us. But I want to bring you down to the, these words in verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. There's a particular uh, picture that is presented to us here of the care of uh, the shepherd. Because there's a bit of a change from what you have in the earlier verses. Because as you know further back there, it tells us about the Lord leading us. Twice over it mentions in verse 2 and in verse 3. It mentions the Lord leading us. And that's the normal custom uh, in, the, in Bible lands as to how a shepherd looks after uh, their sheep. We might be accustomed in this part of the world to drive sheep. We'll come behind them. Um, maybe more modern means today with quads and so on. Than, than, but still the old sheepdog is used. And there's the gathering up and the rounding up of the sheep. But we mostly come behind them. And the sheep are driven along. But that's in Bible lands. The shepherd leads the sheep. You think of John 10, where the Lord uses that picture when he says, He calleth his own sheep by name, and he leadeth them out, and my sheep follow me, he says. And there you have the picture, the common picture of the shepherd, that he would go before the sheep, and he would lead them along. And the shepherd would be so intimate with his sheep that he would, he would be calling them by name. Because sometimes in the sheepfold there would be a number of flocks that's how the shepherds would join together at night and bring their sheep down into the one uh, sheepfold. And as you, if you ever see any of those sheepfolds from the land of Israel, there's just a little opening, just wide enough for one sheep to go through. They just have to squeeze through. That's how the shepherd counts them as they're going in. And you know the, the, the parable of the, the, the shepherd counting in his sheep and he gets to 99. Well, that's, that's a common picture among the Jews. The, shepherd, the sheep squeezing in through that little opening. And then the shepherd lies down in that opening. For the night he becomes the door. And the Lord Jesus said, I am the door of the sheepfold. And the wild beasts could not get in unless they go through the shepherd. And many as a shepherd give his life in, in the, the, the natural, physical sense protecting the sheep that were in the sheepfold. And the Lord uses all of that picture to represent the gospel. And he says, I am the door and I give my, my life for the sheep. But the shepherd would then in the morning lead his sheep out. And there was, as I say, there'd be a number of different flocks in the sheepfold. So he would, he would call his own sheep by name. And the sheep would recognize the voice of the shepherd and they'd begin to follow their shepherd. And as they would leave the sheepfold, there'd be some going up and off in one direction, some going off in another direction because they were the sheep of that particular flock and they would hear the voice of the shepherd and they would follow the shepherd. So the custom in the land of the east was that the sheep would follow the shepherd. But when you come here to verse 6, you'll notice the change around because it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. So we have changed from the beginning of the psalm where the Lord is leading us. Now he's following us. Now he's coming behind us. Now it describes his goodness and his mercy as it comes behind us, as it follows us. Does that not suggest to us that the sheep maybe are wandering off the path a little, that they've turned aside somewhat from where they ought to be going and the shepherd has to leave leading them and he has to come around and, and follow them up and seek after them and try to turn them back onto the path. You see, if you go back over to that portion that we read there in Ezekiel chapter 34, as you'll notice as we have read down that portion, the Lord speaks about his sheep being scattered. 
And he speaks about the need of seeking out the flock. For example, in verse 11, Ezekiel 34, verse 11, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out, as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day, but he is among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. So there is that work that the the good shepherd does in following after his people, seeking to draw them back again into the way. That's what the psalmist here has in mind when he speaks here about surely goodness and mercy following him all the days of his life. He's thinking of the Lord's watchful care over him. He's thinking of the Lord's attentive care and his restoring care. The Lord would have us to walk in that way that is pleasing to him. The Lord would have us to follow the shepherd closely and intently. But as we know, there's times our hearts drift. There's times we can drift. There's times we can get turned aside. We can get distracted. And there's those times then where the shepherd comes and he's following us now. He's not out in front leading. No, he's coming behind. He's following with the purpose of turning us again onto that path getting us back to where we ought to be with the Lord. I want to draw your attention to some very obvious points here from this statement. I want you first of all to notice the certainty of this care. And we start there with the word surely. Surely goodness and mercy. David David was convinced of this in his own life. And without going into his life and multiplying different incidences, You can think of different times in David's life when the Lord did indeed come to him in a gracious way and follow after him and turn him again into the path of obedience that he might follow the Lord. David David himself mentions a number of times, or it's mentioned off David, maybe is a better way of putting it, about David following the sheep as he was a shepherd in his own experience. For example, in 2 Samuel 7, And verse 8, where it says, Now therefore shall thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. So David, in his own experience as a shepherd looking after his father's sheep, there were times when he had to follow the sheep as well. He had to do the very thing in in a material and practical way that the Lord was now doing for his soul and that he speaks of here in Psalm 23 and verse 6. So David thinks about what he was doing in his own life, looking after his father's sheep. And then he says, that's exactly what the Lord is doing in my life spiritually. Just as I have followed after those sheep that have had the tendency maybe to turn aside and they're not following in the way that they ought to be. And I've followed after them and I've sought to get them into the way. Now David is saying, that's how the Lord has acted towards me. That's the care that he has shown towards me as well. And he has listed all this other uh, care and the different aspects of it as you go down those different clauses there in Psalm 23. But here he's coming to a conclusion and he's thinking about this as well. This is absolutely essential too. Don't we have to acknowledge, Christian, that at times there is a proneness to wander? We sing it in that hymn. As in 195, in the hymnal, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, the third verse has those lines, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O take and seal it. Seal it from thy courts above. And there is a proneness in us. But there's a certainty here that the shepherd will seek after us and follow after us. That's part of his care. You see, that marks us out as as belonging to him. If we are those who know and experience this care, that marks us out as being sheep of his pasture. There is a certainty to this. The Lord will most certainly do this if we are the sheep of his pasture. Because that's the care that he exercises to those that are his. Surely... David says. Surely this is true. And David could testify by experience. And maybe today we can do the same. Maybe we can say, yes, I can testify by experience. I know that very thing. The Lord has been gracious to my soul. And he has come after me and followed me and brought me back into the way. And even as we start out onto a new year, 
Can we not thank the Lord for his care of us? Where would we be today if the Lord was not preserving us and watching over us? Where would we be if the Lord did not come in his, his grace and goodness and get us back into the way at times? Because there is that proneness within us. But there's a certainty here. The Lord will most certainly do this. And how encouraging and comforting uh, that is. But then I want you to think a little uh, more on, on the next point. These companions that are mentioned here in this verse. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. These are like two friends, two companions that are always together with regards to the Lord's care of us. Goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. The best way to understand uh, these terms is just to notice a few other places in the scripture where this word appears. And hopefully that will illustrate for us, well, what does the psalmist mean here? What does he have in view when he's thinking about this care of the Lord for our souls? And he speaks about the Lord's goodness. And if I can turn you to a few references uh, in this regard. When we think about his goodness, there's the thought of his favor here. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 26, there are words that have to do with Samuel. The child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. And the word favor is exactly the same word as goodness here in Psalm 23, verse 6. So there's in this word the idea of favor, even the idea of being a favorite. We might have our, our favorite this or that or the other thing. Well, God has his favorites, and his favorites are his people. They're those whom he has redeemed. They're the sheep of his pasture. They're the Lord's favorites. They're those that the Lord has a particular interest in and a delight in and an interest in their welfare. So there's the thought here of being favored of God. So when we think about his goodness, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We're thinking about the favor of God, God favoring an individual. Now, the word favor has the idea, if we use it uh, in, in the sense that is here, of one being favored over another. No, the world doesn't like that terminal, type of terminology today that God would favor one individual over another, but he does. God has his redeemed people whom he favors. He might have a general care that he exercises over all the world as the creator and the God of providence in this world. But as we know, there is a special favor that he exercises in this world towards his redeemed, to those who are the sheep of his pasture. And wherever they might be across the face of the earth, at any given time, there is a special care that he exercises towards them, a special favor that he shows towards them. They're especially in his mind. And that's the thought that is here in, in this word goodness. Surely God's favor will follow me all the days of my life. This special favor that he doesn't have for all the people of the world, that he only has for those who are his own. You see, if you're here this morning and you're unsaved in this meeting, and you, you might be a stranger to me and I'm a stranger to you, but the Lord knows your heart if you're not saved. You don't have his care in that sense if you're still unsaved. You cannot have his care. Yes, there are blessings the Lord bestows upon you generally in this world because he's good to all the world in that sense and he makes provision for all the world in that sense. But we're, we're speaking here about his special goodness, his special favor that he bestows upon those that are his. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your savior and you're not saved, then you cannot know this favor. You cannot know this goodness ever following after you. In fact, it's the very opposite. The Bible tells us it's God's condemnation that's over your head, not his goodness following you. And it'll not be anything different until you seek Christ for salvation and repent of your sins and come to know him. But when you do come to know him, we can have the favor of God attending our way. In Esther chapter 10, verse 3, you've got another usage of this word. And it has to do with Mordecai. And Mordecai is a great type of Jesus Christ. And it says there, For Mordecai the Jew was next unto King Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth 
of his people and speaking peace to all his seed. Now this is after Mordecai has been raised up to that uh, place of prominence and honor in, uh, uh, in the Median Persian kingdom. And he used that position that he had, not for himself. It wasn't an exercise in self-promotion or, or, or gaining anything for himself. No, it tells us that he used that position to seek the wealth of his people or to seek the goodness of his people. For it's exactly the same word as you have in Psalm 23 and verse 6. So there is then in this word goodness the thought of, of wealth, not, not material wealth. Spiritual wealth, all the wealth of God in Christ Jesus that comes to a redeemed soul, all of the blessings of the gospel that are ours in him. That's what's contained here in this, this word goodness. Surely his goodness will follow me. You see, the Lord favors his people to bless them. Was that not the case with bringing Israel out of Egypt all those years ago? Did he not bring them out of Egypt to bring them into Canaan? Was that not God's purpose for them? He brought them out of the land of bondage and servitude and affliction with the purpose of bringing them into the land of Canaan, to that land that, that he had prepared for them. He told them, there's houses built that you haven't built. There's vineyards here you haven't planted. There's olive yards here you're going to enjoy. There's all of these blessings that I have provided for you. He brings them out, you see, to bring them in. He delivers them from bondage to bring them into blessing. And so it is with those whom he saves, those whom he cares for, as the shepherd of the sheep he saved our souls that he might bless us. And there's blessing today. There's blessing this year, Christian, for our souls because of the one who is our shepherd. Zacharias 1.17, one last one. It says there, Zechariah 1.17, Cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and he shall yet choose Jerusalem. Zechariah 1.17, My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. That's the same words, prosperity, as is here, goodness. So in this word, goodness, there is a thought of prospering. Prospering spiritually. Going on with God, growing in grace knowing more of the Lord's mercy and blessing. All of this is contained in, in this thought of his goodness attending our way. So when we think about these words, surely goodness and mercy, and they're so familiar to us, but sometimes maybe the familiarity breeds contempt, as the old saying goes. And, and we quote them and we, we know them so well, but maybe we miss out just on the significance of them. There is this thought of prosperity. If the Lord is following us, then we'll prosper. If the Lord's looking out for us, taking care of us, yes, maybe even sometimes coming around behind us and following us to get us back into the way that we ought to go, that's for our good. That's for our prosperity. He's doing it that it might go well with us. He's not doing it in, 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 in some way to to make life miserable. No, he's doing it that we might enjoy the fullness of God. So you have his goodness that follows us. Then you have his mercy here as well that follows us. And again, it's interesting just to notice how that word is used in, in the scriptures. For example, in Isaiah 55 and verse 3, it speaks there about the sure mercies of David. And the thought there is of the covenant mercies. They're covenanted unto the people of God. And that's why they're described there as the sure mercy. In fact, it's a title for Jesus Christ, if you look at it in the context. There are mercies that he bestows upon us that are sure. That are sure. You think of those words in Lamentations 3 about the mercies of God. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. But for some... Uh, Sorry, verse 32 of Lamentations 3, it says, But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. The multitude of his mercies. Can you or I ever exhaust the multitude of his mercies? 
Can we ever exhaust those? Well, now there's times, well, there's times when we certainly use up his mercies. If we do drift and we're not in the path of obedience the way that we ought, are we not using up his mercies? If the Lord does come and he follows after us and he seeks to bring us back into the way and get us on the right path, are we not using up his mercies? We most certainly are, but there's a multitude of his mercies. The Lord is merciful to us. And it's mercy that follows after us. That, that word, mercy, that you have here in Psalm 23 is the word that Naomi uses when she came back to Bethlehem, or at least set out to come back to Bethlehem. For example, in Ruth 1 and verse 8, Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, or the Lord deal mercifully with you. It's the same word, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord deal kindly. Now, as we know, Naomi had a bitter experience. And her bitter experience was brought upon by their, their disobedience. They left the land of Israel and they went down to sojourn in the land of Moab, as we know, thinking to avoid the consequences of the famine. But the famine, the famine was a chastisement from God. Deuteronomy tells us that. The Lord told Israel that if you depart from me and turn out of the path, I will bring famine to the land. So if you get to Ruth and you read there in the opening words of Ruth chapter 1 about the famine in the land, you have to conclude, and according to the book of Deuteronomy, the reason why there's a famine in the land is because the nation has turned away from the Lord and this is chastisement. And you see Abimelech and, and Naomi thought, we, we can get out of this, we can, we can, we can bypass all of this. We don't have to stay here and, and, and submit to the chastisement of the Lord and be part of this turning process unto the Lord. No, we'll go down into Moab and sojourn for a few years. We'll avoid all of this. And to their bitter cost, they went down into Moab. And Naomi came back. Did, did, does it not say that she had heard in Moab how the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. There had been a repentance among them and a turning to the Lord. And then the Lord said, if you do that, I'll, I'll take away the famine. I'll bring you days of plenty again. So evidently there'd been a, a, a turning to the Lord in the land of Judah all the time when Naomi was down in Moab. And she had to come back home. And she said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. For the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. The Lord dealt bitterly with her because of the choices that they had made. But even then, even then when she had realized what the Lord had done to her, she was also conscious of his mercies. And here speaking to her daughters-in-law, she said, The Lord deal kindly with you. She knew there was mercy with the Lord. She was hoping for his mercy. She was going back. She had come to that place where she realized, I need to get back into the way. I need to forsake Moab. She'd never have been here in the first place. I need to get back to Bethlehem. I need to get back into the right way. And she was going. She was heading back. And she knew that there were mercies from the Lord to, to have. And she told her daughters-in-law about them. But then verse uh, Ruth chapter 2 and verse 20, you read more about this, this mercy. And in Ruth chapter 2 verse 20, Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, because as we know Ruth, Ruth came along with her, wouldn't leave her. And then she says to Ruth, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and the dead. And it's a reference there to the conduct of Boaz towards Ruth. And those handfuls on purpose that he gave her. And when Ruth goes back home and tells Naomi of what has happened to her as she's gleaned in the field that day, Naomi rejoices and she speaks about the goodness of God. It's the same word here, or the kindness of God rather. She rejoices in the kindness of God. It's the same word mercy here. 
There's, there's mercies with the Lord. There's mercies with the Lord, Christian. And how thankful we ought to be. And maybe, maybe we've had a better experience in some way. I don't know your circumstances. But maybe today you come into God's house. And maybe there is a better experience in your life. In your circumstances. Your home, your family. I don't know. But you know there's mercies with the Lord. The Lord can temper those better experiences with mercies. He's such a shepherd. And may that be our experience even today. So there's, you have the, the certainty of it and the, the companions. I want you to notice finally here the, the constancy of it. Because it says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. All the days of my life. So here's something that the psalmist is testifying to all through his life. Up until that point in time, he, he can look back, he can survey over his own life, and he can say, all my life long, the Lord has been following after me, attending to me, taking care of me. He's been doing it with goodness and mercy. What a testimony that is, to be able to say that all of our lives, all of our, our lives as we survey them. But not only... Is it all of our lives? But if you notice how he puts it there, it's all the days of my life. It wasn't just intermittently. It wasn't just now and again. It wasn't a matter that he could just pinpoint you know, a few times over many years and say, oh, at that particular time and at that particular time and there's another time as well. No, that's not what the psalmist is saying. The psalmist is saying every day, all the days of my life, each and every day, and God's care of his people is not intermittent. It's not that somehow the Lord just dips in now and again to care for us. And the rest of the time he just leaves us on our own to make our own way through. It's every day. All the days of our life. And it doesn't matter what the day is or the circumstances. The Lord bestows his, his care upon us. Is that not the thought that is in those words in Lamentations 3.22? It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. They are new every morning. And that's in the context of his mercies. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And it's not a matter, Christian, of only now and again knowing his care. It's every day, every new day, every morning that we get up and go out to face the circumstances of, of that day. The Lord, is, the Lord is taking care of us. The Lord is, is the shepherd of our souls. I, I finish off with those, with just turning you back to Ezekiel 34 and those verses that we read in our Bible reading. There's a great contrast there. I, I don't have the time this morning to, to set that out in any way before you. But as we have read down those uh, verses, the first ten verses is all about the false shepherds. It's all about the shepherds who had a name to be a shepherd, but they never cared for the sheep. They only cared for themselves. And then everything changes when you come to verse 11. And the Lord says, I'll be the shepherd. I'll be the shepherd of this sheep. Those who are false shepherds, I'm going to judge you, he says. I'm going to pour my, my, my chastisement upon you. But I am going to be the shepherd of this people. And beginning at verse 11 and on down through those next uh, verses, you have wonderful statements of what the Lord will do. I will do this. I will, I will do this. I will do the other thing. The Lord is the shepherd. And there is a care that the Lord exercises for us. As his people. Now maybe sometimes that care is to get us back into the way. But whether it's, it's that care to get us back into the way or not. The Lord has a care for us. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. All the days of my life. 
And as we've just launched out into this year, and whatever days the Lord gives us throughout the year to come, we can be sure of one thing, Christian. His goodness and mercy will be there every day. Whatever else will come our way. And none of us know. But there's some things that are sure. God's mercy and God's goodness will attend our way. All the days of our life. And may we rest in that. May we rejoice then that we are the sheep of his pasture. And if you're not saved this morning, oh, I trust the Lord would bring you to know this shepherd. You, you don't have such care. You have nobody to care for your soul. You're a prey for the devil if you're not saved. And the devil's out to take you to hell. That's where he, he'll promise you everything. He'll give you plenty too, maybe, along the way, but he'll take you to hell. You don't have anyone to care for your soul. Not until you come to Jesus Christ. And may you come even today. May the Lord bless his word for his name's sake. Let's just bow together in prayer for a moment. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the one who is the good shepherd. And for the care that he exercises over us all the days of our life. And may we indeed know that goodness and mercy following us. Bless thy word. To us all, Lord, whatever our spiritual state is, we pray that thou will tailor thy word to fit our, our circumstances. And may we know the Lord speaking today to us. Be with us as we come to a close in this part of our, our service. Tarry with those that remain around this table. Those, Lord, who would take their leave of us, go with them. Grant us thy blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.